Good afternoon. Hello. Well, hello there. You can hear me. Very good. That's that's a treat. How are you doing? Good to finally meet you. Yeah, good to finally meet you too. It's uh, yeah, a bit random. I just thought I'd have uh, office hours for a while. And how is that going so far? Oh, uh, well, you're the first in and my friend uh, oh. Joe is joining us as well. Hello. Hey, guys. Looking very serious today. I need to get my snack. Snack. Yeah. Well, I have my coffee, even though it's in a teacup. Sorry about that. That's cool. I just had some chocolate. It hasn't kicked in yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> yes. The chocolate is what really powers the internet. Yeah, so I just thought, um, because there's so many conversations and it's so difficult to meet up, that uh, I just hold office hours on Friday for an hour. And then mm -hmm. on um, Mondays, I have something more around the visual meta concept, because we're trying to build a community around that, which is not easy, obviously. And it's really kind of strange how long it takes really intelligent people to get things, because they're so brilliant in their field. So if it's something completely different, that's fine. But if it's slightly different, you know, that reorientation is very interesting. I've talked to a few people who 
or enthusiastic. And then literally a month or two later, they say, ah, how about so-and-so? So anyway, hard conversations, but useful. But very glad you guys are here. Have you met? Do you know each other, by the way? No, I don't think we have. Hi, Joseph. I'm Derek. Hey, Derek. Calling in from Banff, Alberta, Calgary, uh, Canada. Alberta, yeah, that's a good place. Uh, cool. I'm in London, uh, so I'm just across town um, from Froja, but uh, you know, we we uh, couldn't meet in person today, so we do it online. So that's good. Uh, yeah. Plus, it's always fun to be part of the first ever, uh, you know, thing. So that's that's cool. Glad to meet you. Are you also involved with the University of Southampton in some way? Uh, not. Not really formally and not for a long time. Uh, I, they, I think I was a partner on a grant uh, that where they were in the partner. I was part of a partner that was on the grant where they were. So that's, that's how we met, but that was probably what, four or five years ago now. So, see. Yes, when I started my PhD, which I'm still working on, and as Wendy Hall, my advisor asked uh, last week, you're part-time, right? No, I am full-time, <laughs> just not a very good student. <laughs> so, um, I haven't heard back from her since then. I wonder why. <laughs> so that might have been a message of some sort. Some sort, yes. There's also a message and no message, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a bit louder. So what is it that you're working on, Joseph? A um, number of things. I just came out of a startup accelerator or startup incubator. So we didn't ever actually end up pitching for funding. So right now I'm working on picking up the pieces of that, which has actually been really fun. I think I'm much happier working outside of the uh, incubator without the constraints that that poses, you know, like, so they asked for us to pick a partner from the team there. Well, actually, I know a bunch of people for, you know, 15 years or longer, so why not work with them? And it was all about pitching for VC funding, which comes with certain constraints. Why not explore the landscape and think about different ways to fund it? So, um, so that's what I'm doing literally right now uh, in another window from, from where you guys are. Um, and then apart from that, I'm uh, looking around for other things that would actually pay the bills because that, that isn't, we're not really like at a revenue stage in this startup and may never be. I think it, it has morphed into more of like a research collaboratory, but just to kind of explain what it does and, and what, what, what the pitch would be is, I'm interested in applying AI methods to open source public data and producing better uh, material for this kind of public commons um, that you wouldn't get without the AI there. And you know, a, a lot of what we see in terms of AI is like companies like Facebook or whatever taking quasi public information and using it basically to enhance their bottom line, which is great for them and lots of people find the service valuable. Um, but uh, in terms of really kind of trying to contribute to a commons, um, AI is not really even part of the equation, just maybe a little bit uh, with Wikipedia has some bots, for example, but it's, it's much more limited. Um, so that, that's what the idea was about. And we're, we're looking at a, a number of different thematic demos that we could get in front of somebody. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Um, but yeah, looking around at other things too. I think, uh, uh, writing. Um, I've got a book, uh, which is in the third edition. I'm thinking about pitching a project to make the fourth edition of the book and maybe just doing another postdoc uh, as well. So yeah, that's, that's me in a nutshell. How about yourself? Uh, before we, um, before we go, go back to Before you, we get going. Uh, David okay. just uh, joined us. Cool. So just uh, a quick hello. Hey. Oh, How David. Doing, guys? Hi, hey. just I, I like your rustic setting. Yeah, yeah I'm in Vermont. What could be oh, more very appropriate, nice. <laughs> even though it's a virtual background, but uh, yeah, I'm in Vermont. The yeah, very, very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so Derek, you were going to um, kind sure. of talk about what you're up to. Um, as I said, I'm located in Banff. I'm the Director of Literary Arts at the Banff Center for Arts and Creativity. So uh, that means literally I'm, I'm currently in my office. I have to sign in because of uh, COVID restraints, but I am currently perched on the side of Sleeping Buffalo Mountain in Canada's oldest national park um, in a 87-year-old institution that focuses entirely on uh, arts education and, um, and a cultural mandate. We're a university that does not grant degrees, so it's uh, no courses, no classes, very much in a, in a format like perhaps um, 
it's a cross between a arts artist retreat and Black Mountain College if we needed like historic references. And um, in addition to my work as director, I'm a uh, poet and conceptual writer, the author of uh, 25 books of uh, visual poetry, uh, essays, conceptual writing. And these days I'm working hard at trying to um, rebuild our uh, literary arts residencies here at the center uh, in a, uh, a post-COVID budget, shall we say, uh, and try to determine what an arts, uh, literary arts residency looks like when um, there are restrictions about uh, international travel, um, about quarantining, and about physical distance. So usually we would have 25, 30 art, uh, authors in a room with faculty from around the world, um, each one of them with their own cabin, but also gathering together for group sessions and uh, editing sessions and workshops and trying to reconfigure what that looks like. And uh, because of the uh, extent of that work, admittedly, my own writing has been relatively quiet for the last six, eight months. But um, my next volume comes out from Gimo Press uh, in, in the UK, uh, which is a series of visual poems that have been interpreted by a, a uh, graffiti artist and muralist here in Alberta. So, so that's what I'm up to. <laughs> I mentioned that I was uh, working on possibly pitching a, f a fourth edition of the book. This is a book I just put a link, not by me, but it's it's about reimagining the art school, and yeah, maybe. Well, that looks interesting. I'll check that out. Useful for your uh, purposes, yeah. Yeah, this thank you. By the guy who's, um, I think, uh, maybe the former director of the Edinburgh College of Art. Um, but yeah, picks up some of the ideas related to. Okay, research. I'll have a look. Thank you. And David, would you mind giving us a quick tour of uh, what you're working on? Yeah, other than a cool background, what are you up to? Uh, uh, well, just a couple of things. First of all, I'm in Hardwick, Vermont, which sits next to Buffalo Mountain. Just a little coincidence there. I've yeah, been there, to okay. Banff. Yeah. And uh, well, Frode, I want to just uh, say one thing to you. I, I shared uh, a link to the email you sent me with my uh, programmer director David Boyer, a very sophisticated guy. He was blown away by your UI UX. He thought it was the most elegant thing he'd seen, uh, and really, really appreciated uh, your perspective. And he said, "That's how I. That's my vision of beauty." <laughs> so, uh, the, and David is a really smart guy. So that's uh, should be taken as quite a compliment coming from him. And in fact, he told me to drop in to see if this would be a good forum to have a conversation around uh, some of the things that we're doing in relationship to what you've been doing. So I have uh, been involved. I just need uh, to interrupt and say thank you for that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, and just also to add, uh, this is entirely an open forum to add anyone. It literally is an open door to any conversation. So if he or other of your team and friends would like to join, that's very appropriate. Great. And I'd like to know more about what you're doing, of course. Yeah. So uh, when I was, so I don't, I mean, there's a long story and a short story. So I'll, I'll tell the short story and then later if people want to hear more. Basically for quite a few years, I've been working with a variety of people, but more recently with uh, Dave Boyer on uh, what I've come to think of as a frame building tool. And it's specifically designed to assist human beings in sense making around combining pieces of information from multiple online sources to create something of value, particularly through creative synthesis and to come up with innovative ideas. And it is a tool that everyone talks about, but nobody's built. Because essentially what we allow you to do is you import a whole bunch of documents, you highlight, you comment, you can do it with other people, and then you select specific fragments of text from 10, 20, 100, 500 documents to uh, the right margin of the page, which can be represented in many different ways, with instantaneous links back to where each piece of information came from. And then what you do is you arrange those pieces into a narrative structure 
and then you can share that with other people and it's a new form of publication but what we're we're talking to people in the ai area about well okay machines are getting pretty good at building and constructing the interest model of let's say an analyst as they open documents and annotate stuff and do searches and it can recommend oh you might want to read this next what we're talking about is could the machine construct the frame building model this is using the language of data frame theory right how in sort of the schema mental model language transferred to more modern concepts could the machine somehow construct the thinking of the assembler of the narrative as they were placing pieces of information next to each other with coherence and telling a story that covers some topic and use that to assist people in not just finding documents, but finding related snippets across documents. And at the same time, the last thing I'll say is I have done, uh, I've used the system myself, which is still in a pre-release form. I mean, I, we have people using a, a sort of alpha version of it right now to write three papers. Each time I had an aha moment. And so what I'm proposing is, and this is really kind of fascinating and then I'll shut up, is that this idea of, you know, you come into a space to study a topic with the idea of, you know, what new idea might surface through this effort. And people talk about developing fluid and crystalline knowledge, right? You get to the point where A, you can actually come up with new ideas within the space because you've informed yourself enough, you've prepared the mind and pastor's sense for that moment of insight. And you have this crystalline knowledge where you've linked your current knowledge to what you already know sufficiently that now you're, you're in a position to actually be able to do something within this space that might go beyond just verbally repeating what other people have said. And what I, you know, so if you think about that, oh, chance favors the prepared mind. Well, when does that point occur? Is it all incremental? Is it an accretion process? You just need to keep going. And my experience, surprisingly to me, has been, no, it's a phase change. So I've been working on a particular project involving reading about, you know, going through maybe 30 or 40 research articles, five or six days of arranging these pieces of information into a narrative. And I'm still, yeah, this is related, but I'm not sure my comments were sort of weak. And then I get up one morning and all of a sudden, bang, it all makes sense. It's like a light went off. And so there's this sense to me of if you stick with something long enough, which is really a problem these days because a lot of young people don't have that ability to concentrate. You know, they don't even have the brain circuits. You can achieve you can go beyond your expectations. So that's, that's what I've been doing. I'm very fascinated by how you talked about phase change. Uh, obviously, I'm interested in the notion of liquid information. And when I first met Doug Engelbart, our very first sit down together where he talked about his vision, which is the same as mine, except a million times bigger. And he then, um, you know, sitting there physically electrified in my bones, never felt anything like it until last Friday when I had heart surgery. <laughs> but that's <laughs> <another> electricity. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, and then he asked me about the liquid thing. And I said, yes, the whole point is to make information liquid and the processes, but not to get there. Because if it's completely liquid, it's useless as if it's completely frozen. So when you talk about the phase changes, I'd like to hear more about what you have to say, because Poetically, it gives a sense of um, being on a different plane or something, but I'm sure you have something more specific about that, I guess. So I can give you an example okay. that might illustrate the point. So, you know, I, my product, Highlighter, is, it, we, it initially came out of academia, and we realized that working with academia was not an easy thing to do to get a product to market. We started a business with actually the former president of Florida State University, this guy, Dale Lick, who's been, been with him now many years. Um, so um, the, uh, some of the people I worked with, worked with the people at uh, 
uh, Klein and Hoffman that did the work on data frame theory, right? So that's one piece. So here I have a lot of, I've read a bunch of articles, a lot of familiarity. And now I'm trying to characterize what is Highlighter? What have we built? Because it is a unique application, this thing of, and it's incredibly complicated under the hood. It looks like it's doing something simple. Oh, I'll take this piece of, this fragment of text and this comment that's in this document, I'll move it over here. And then I'll go to another document and another document. And now I've got this collection of snippets and comments with links back. And now I'm going to rearrange them and create some kind of coherence between the JSON highlights that tells a story. So I started to uh, look at, think about Highlighter as a thought processor. So, oh, this is first in class thought processor, right? It's allowing you to somehow work with ideas from multiple documents and arrange them into different orders. A different order. And then I had, you know, the concept of collaborative sense making, right? That, oh, this is an extension of all this stuff around sense making, except it's document centric sense making when you're trying to combine pieces of information from many sources. And then I looked at uh, extended cognition and the idea of, um, oh, this is an external memory technology. Right, because it allows you to, you know, it, it, a lot of people when I've talked to them, they say, well, I read all these articles, but I can't remember what I read and where it was. I said, well, here's Highlighter. That'll allow you to kind of create this, extend your short-term memory by having this place where you can hold all of these ideas with the ability to go back to where they came from instantaneously, very quickly, and, and update your comments and so forth. And so uh, about uh, two weeks ago, well, three weeks ago, we did a demo for this guy, Chris North, who is at Virginia Tech, and he's one of the leaders in AI, large arrays, and visual analytics. And I suggest, if you're not familiar with the SAGE project, S-A-G-E, definitely take a look at it. Very cool stuff, it, because it's about how do you use wall size arrays with AI and visual analytics to promote sense making and thinking and analysis. And because uh, it's kind of funny, I mean, everybody wants to do things on their little phone, but we're in the age of information overload. So why would you want small? Okay. There are, there are some- To answer your question, I was yeah. setting you up now. This idea, you know, so the idea of things hiding in plain sight. Yeah. I, I started reading these articles uh, and, uh, from Chris, he sent me four or five articles and he has these concepts. It's using AI on small data sets to do using incremental formalism and semantic interaction. So the machine observes the analyst doing stuff and it creates an interest model and uses semantic interaction to visualize it, right? So I'm reading this stuff and so forth and I'm writing comments and I'm bringing, but it's not adding up to, you know, I'm sort of, oh, I trust if I just stick with this long enough and use highlighter, I'll have my insight. And at one day after engaging enough, having, you know, read the articles, highlighted them, moved them over to the, what we call a high trail, a highlight trail, and then moving them around, the pieces around to try and arrange them in a, in a sort of storyline that other people would see as coherent, right? Because it, it is like almost a Turing test. You know, uh, except this is, you know, you can imagine a machine doing this as well. But right. I had, I, I get up, I sit down and I, I do, I start from the beginning and start reviewing and I'm updating my comments and all of a sudden things started to make sense that weren't making sense just the day before. And the first idea was, oh, this is a frame building tool. Highlighter is about Building, you know, so data frame theory is about how you either add new information to your current frame, your schema in the old terms of mental model, and um, either update it, accrete, attune, attune it, or radically restructure it or restructure it because you have new information, that, right? And I realized, oh, when you're taking those pieces of information, putting them into the highlight trail or the high trail and rearranging them to create a storyline, you're building your frame. Highlighter is a frame building tool. Who, what other tool allows you to do that, right? And then I, so that, that was when I said, hey, 
how come I only thought of this now after working on this for 10 years, right? And it was because engaging with the content in a certain way over time prepared, made the connections so that I, and I had several other insights that followed yeah. from that. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that's very clear in the conversations over the years with different people working towards the same problem you're working on, but of course, in different ways is our imagination is limited. We got to build and play and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hope I wasn't too long winded with that, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, no, I think that was a good frame. And it also, I think, shows quite a bit of commonality, at least I know with uh, Joe. Um, a lot of what you're talking about uh, works along what he's been thinking about, what I've been thinking about. And I'd love to hear what Derek has to say on, um, on this. Well, I think the, the interesting thing to me is that those limitations of reading and of sense making that you were talking about, I think that that's in a lot of ways what holds poets in my side. Uh, poets back is a sense that, um, I mean, Froda, you just said that the idea that like some that you just have to make it and play and see what happens. Um, I'm surprised, I'm frequently surprised how adverse to risk poets tend to be and writers tend to be. That the idea of creating something that is um, traditionally nonsensical or asensical that may not look or feel or sound like a poem. Um, is, is something that I, I think a great deal of poets are very adverse to. And the idea of uh, harvesting or copying information, particularly off the internet, uh, is still, I think, seen despite, you know, several you know, decades of, of, of people arguing uh, the opposite, it's still seen as cheating. It's still seen as somehow um, non-poetic, a creative, and um, that poetry in particular is still very much stunk with, is stuck with the, with the humanist and the personal. So if you're not talking about yourself, you're not talking about your emotions, and you're not doing the talking, you're not doing the writing itself, uh, not, it's, it's not an issue of whether or not it's good poetry. It ends up being an issue of whether or not it's poetry at all. And, uh, and, for the most part, it's seen as no, no. It's uh, you know, it's it's seen as widely um, dismissible as as copying and as harvesting, as opposed to you know reading. And you know, the idea of using another tool to do your reading for you and to gather this and sense make it. This is this is the future of writing. This is what writing should be. Um, but our I think in a great deal uh, for a lot of poets, poets are still thinking that, you know, you have to write it for it to be yours, you know, like, so, well, literally. Let me just point out that yeah. in, so it, so this is the, you, what's missing is this idea of generative learning, which is here's a topic, here's eight perspectives from eight different authors. I yeah. can look, and I've juxtaposed these related ideas that would be very hard to hold in my head if I couldn't place them on this palette. And the process is here's what A, B, C, D, these different people say linked to what I already know. Here's a whole new idea. Mm -hmm. So it isn't a question of appropriating what they're saying. It's a, it's a creative synthesis process. Now I may decide, you know, of, of these perspectives, I like Joe's perspective. And I'm going to sort of make that my own, right? Which is what we do. But the whole point of Highlighter to, ex to an extent is to support creative synthesis by allowing you to deal with different perspectives and rearrange them in a way that you can't when they're located in 10 different documents. You can put them next yeah. to each other, right? Yeah. And but that's, that's, still, that's exactly yeah. what, that's exactly what a, a poet should be doing is, is the... I mean, that's what a metaphor is, you know, is the, is the creative combining of, op, of, of opposing viewpoints, you know, like right. it, it, it's yeah. the, it's the role of the, of the writer to hold simultaneously opposing views in your head at the same time mm -hmm. and come up with something stranger, cooler, synthetic, uh, synthesizing. And if we have a tool that can help us do that, all the better. 
Um, yeah, that's that to me is that's what we're supposed to be doing. So, so this Darren, I would sound very very. Yeah, I'm a bit shocked to hear what you have to say, but yeah, of course it's true. I mean, my background is arts. I went to Chelsea mm -hmm. School of Art. I was going to be a visual artist until I had the realization that the only person who knows who an artist is is the artist himself. So that kind of shut that whole entire world down for me. But um, <clears throat> because there is, you know, in solving the world's problems, I just started reading this. Are you guys familiar with this book? Yeah. yeah. No. No more anything. Okay. Yeah. It's um, basically a Trump manifesto. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Why vote Trump? From an, um, a very well presented perspective and. You know, we're, we're sitting here, we're talking about what David's talking about with proper knowledge work, and we have to work on that. That's also my field. But if we don't take into account this stuff, which is almost outside, but hopefully not. I mean, I sent this PDF to you guys in the invitation as kind of a call to arms. And the point that I'm trying to make is that we need to learn to think better with tools, both for the obvious reasons, but also in general. So, uh, David, what you're talking about resonates with a lot of conversations I've had with a lot of people in California, particularly. No surprise there. But as you say, uh, not very much has been actually made. So I'm very excited to hear what you guys are making. And uh, even more than that, I'm very excited to create a community around this because for the 50th anniversary of Doug's demo, we did have a bunch of people working on stuff. But we got a bit... Um, sidetracked or hijacked by a, a, a faction, I will say nicely, who wanted to be all about graphs. You put your knowledge graph here, I put mine, we figure out something in the middle and we'll understand each other. Doesn't which work is that way. No, it's not gonna work, <laughs> absolutely. But it's a fine research thing. I'm sure some good stuff will come out of it, but it was so, other stuff doesn't matter. So nothing really happened, um, yes. So, so, uh, there are some references to things. Have, have you guys seen this? Ah, ooh, exciting. That's, I've seen a little Well, well, well. Yeah. Um, if the resolution was good enough, you'd see your names here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, gotta, can, I, can I do a little uh, show and tell while we're showing and telling books and judging them? By I've shown you book. mine. You can show me yours. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah. So we just mentioned about poetry, and I, I had to get this one off the shelf because uh, there's a really nice classical Japanese poetic form, which is inherently collaborative. And uh, so that, that's an interesting example of, of co-creating poems. And people were apparently about as obsessed with these as, as contemporary folks could get about Go. In other words, you know, that, that's all they would do is sit around composing these collaborative poems and they'd throw expensive parties for their friends with you know, all kinds of expensive Japanese. What's it called? Uh, the, particular book is called uh, Renku Reckoner, the poetic form, I think it's called Renga. I'm not quite sure why it's called Renku as a more modern appropriation, I guess, of the concept of Renga. But a Renga is, it, it's kind of like linked haiku. So in this context, if we were doing this thing by Renga rules, we kind of go around in a circle and, and link our haikus together to form a, a sort of riff, I guess. Sounds almost like something the Romans would do. It, probably it could well be I, I don't know but but the, 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 the interesting thing about it is it comes with all these constraints which I think are very Japanese in terms of this particular part has to reference the moon and this part has to reference a flower this part has to reference a season so you have to be creative in the context with all these constraints that you know the third verse has to reference the moon and blah blah blah, blah. Mm. anyway so you could call it constraints or you could use David's term of um, framework right yeah yeah, that's right. That's right. So we, so we did, did try to do a little bit of um, like computer generated uh, rangas uh, and they look cool. They made nice poems, but they didn't adhere to those classical constraints. Certainly not. Fully. Is this within your world, Derek? Uh, sure. I mean, the, the, the renga, the idea of, of linked haiku. Um, I mean, I know a number of writers who are working in, in those forms. Um, it's interesting how, once again, you know, like the idea of uh, constraint-based writing is seen as a relatively new idea, and yet it's, you know, whether it be the haiku or the renga um, or the sonnet, these are highly, um, highly regulated, highly constraint-based 
uh, forms of poetry that have constraints on form, syllabics, word count, topic, and and number of participants and numbers of writers. So um, I think the idea of like, I have seen a number of online poetic generators that work in haiku that will do things like scrape Twitter to find uh, poetic arrangements of five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, um, or in an, uh, unintentional sonnets. Um, and it, it seems like there's a number of uh, poetic machines online that are getting ever closer. Not quite, but a lot of ever closers. And uh, it, it's led a, a couple of my colleagues to joke that the, uh, the future of poetics is um, poetry written by machines for machines. Uh, and that we're the, we're the least interesting readers or creators of poetry out there. Uh, and I really like that idea that that's why are we point. writing for an audience that we can already define, write for an audience that we can't expect, uh, using a diction that we don't recognize. That's really interesting. And I have two questions. One, because I was doing it in writing while you were speaking. Are you all okay with recording and public, public making? Sure. I see the little recording button in the corner. Okay, cool. Um, th that, strangely enough, leads me on to visual meta. Um, can I take two or three minutes to explain what it is? I know you've all obviously probably read a bit about it, but I think it relates incredibly much to what you just said. Okay, cool. Because today isn't the visual meta day, but it's so right. So the thing is, um, in a normal book, in one of the first pages, you have this. All I've done is put this in the back. Right. Of the book, right? And it has a few surprising, a few obvious reasons, and this is why I did it. So here, this is the visual meta for the future of textbook. Yep. So uh, the reason I'm mentioning it is uh, what the visual meta does, first of all, is give you citation information. So you can just copy from the document and paste, and it'll be pasted as a citation with all the metadata. It, of course, you can have metadata associated with a PDF, but it's just never done for complicated reasons that are boring. But what it also allows for is to give rich stuff to a flat PDF. For instance, it'll tell you what the headings are so you can fold the document. That's very elemental. We can also do what Vint has started calling computational text. So you can have a sentence last Tuesday, and you can tag that with a specific date which then when you even print the documents, it just says last Tuesday, but in the visual method says, in this location, last Tuesday means certain date. So the whole point of visual meta is that the metadata is at the same level as the text, which is why I call it normal text, that's magic. Now, I've thought of a lot of kind of intellectual and knowledge work sides of this, but for poetry, to be able to mark up your own work and to give it different things and then have it in a platform that have different interactions based on what both you and David were talking about. That's a bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Especially it certainly reaches beyond just an embedded roles. hyperlink. Hmm? What's that? And it reaches beyond the idea of just an embedded hyperlink or, you know, like, you know, last Tuesday link and you get the news for the New York Times that day, you know, that kind of simple structure. Dave Duror, um, who is part of my uh, Future Text Initiative uh, advisory, he said that what it is, is when they were working on hypertext in the 90s, uh, I'm not sure if you know uh, Dave Duror, he's big at Oxford and so on, and Joe, Joe you obviously know him. Um, he said that it was, at that time, they didn't want to have links or formatting embedded, so they would have it separate. But, so what he calls visual meta is a package where they are separate but they just happen to be in, the, in a package that is the document. So any text can have a myriad of things is behind it or not. But from a poetic perspective, and you know, David, you were talking about phase transitions and, and different views, uh, very interesting. Anyway, I just had to drop that in there. So just a quick observation. Uh, so Dave looked at the, your visual meta and said it's like having a barcode but the barcode has the information in it. So it's both 
it's a barcode that a human can read, but also a machine can read. So it gives you this flexibility. The, I, I just want to throw in a far transfer thought to what we've been talking about, and that is uh, team science. So I know uh, this guy, Michael O'Rourke at Michigan State, and he figured out, he put together this workshop for large teams of scientists. So this is somewhat related to this multi poet building, poetry building thing, right? You have these transdisciplinary or cross disciplinary teams that are engaging in like sustainability research and health research. And it doesn't go well because of the boundary issues. And so uh, Mike go, Michael goes into NIH and does these workshops with these large teams of can be a hundred or more scientists that are working together on these big sustainability problems, like how do we save the world and how do we protect ourselves from future pandemics? And it has some of the same elements, right? Of, uh, of you know, how do you bridge um, and create something that has coherence when you're having so many different perspectives and voices coming in and they speak different languages and so forth. So um, in a way, the poetry is an analogy you know, a group poem is an analogy to what transdisciplinary teams uh, are struggling, are struggling with too. And and one of the ideas in Highlighter is to create uh, a cross-disciplinary uh, concordance, so that when you look at a word, you get a high trail that shows exemplars of that word across different fields. So it's not a definition. It here's how practitioners use that term as a tool of the trade to express, uh, communicate something of, of value and so forth. But it just, going back pro to your overall concern for the state of the world and where things are going, we need to be able to work across disciplines much more effectively than we're doing today. And there's a whole science of team science uh, that's emerged as a field that's studying that. And I've been to a couple of their uh, yeah. uh, conferences. And I'll just, just as another example, I wrote a paper on social machines for transdisciplinarity, for transdisciplinary research. And using Highlighter, I had another one of those moments of insight where I realized that the problem of trans disciplinary and cross-disciplinary research goes back to what I think is bringing the end of the world, which is side effects of adaptive features of mind in the evolution of mind that we refer to as cognitive biases, except in the disciplines, cognitive biases became sanctioned. You can't enter the discipline without agreeing to put on a certain lens that biases your view. And so now you bring these people together and they have spent a whole career learning to see the world in a certain way, which is in a way a kind of tunnel vision, a form of cognitive bias. So in using Highlighter, I came up with a new concept that it turns out if you do a Google search, there's only one reference and it's sanctioned cognitive biases. And that's uh, as applied to what it means to be in a discipline. Anyway, I got a little I'm very happy with that term. I think that's very, very prescient and clear. I mean, I remember my father used to say that, you know, a profession is basically a glossary. Mm -hmm. Use different terms, but yeah, very similar to what you're saying, but, but your terminology is fantastic. But I had a discussion with a close friend the other day who was in the military, super intelligent, does incredible stuff. And we were arguing over the notion of facts and I find facts so annoying because there is a, there's all kinds of things bundled up into that, obviously. So the notion of um, poetry to help get around what you're talking about, David, you know, it's like, okay, if I say this is this and translate it as that, that translation is not going to map properly either. But if you use um, an acknowledged poetry, because then you have to think more, mm -hmm. right? Then something magical can happen, which is not necessarily linear in the system. Mm -hmm. Joe, I'm sure you have tons of things. Oh, I just put in the chat. Uh, I just have pitched a course to teach at Tufts. Tufts has got something called an experimental college. So they allow 
anyone who feels qualified to pitch to teach there. And I pitched a course called Transdisciplinary Design. So I feel that links a lot with what David was just talking about. Um, and even the, even the title actually uh, of the course is, is riffing a little bit on a book uh, by Richard P. Gabriel, which talks about both patterns and poetry. So it connects a lot of different themes. Um, but uh, the idea, I guess, in that line of work is to create these short, succinct descriptions of things, which some people might call them poems or poetic forms, but they're meant to embody um, kind of how-to practical knowledge. So, so they're called design patterns. This idea originated in architecture, um, but actually people have used this in a bunch of different disciplines. So that's interesting to have one kind of form that people use in different disciplines ranging from the two main ones are programming and architecture, but they use them a lot of different ways. So um, in my course, I pitched uh, kind of something really interesting and impossible, basically that each student will read their own materials and become an expert in one area. And then collectively, we'll try to develop this shared ability to communicate about those topics. And I don't know if it will be possible. It hasn't been taught yet. Um, so this okay. is my second okay. so time. That pitching something like this to, to Tufts. They didn't, ex they didn't accept the first one because they didn't feel it was sufficiently differentiated. So I've really made this one very differentiated. We'll see if they like it under these, under these circumstances. Well, you just described sort of the next highlighter use case that this professor at George Washington University is doing with her clinical laboratory grad students and undergrads. So the way it works is you pick a topic, each student reads like six articles over six weeks, marks them up, and then you combine them, you make them available to the other students in the class. So if you have 10 students, you've got 60 documents. Each one has been highlighted by the person who was the owner of that document, but now it's available to everybody. And then each student creates their own high trail going through so I read six, but now I get the benefit of your surfacing the high value information in that document. So maybe in my experience doing this, I've done this a few times is a lot of times I just have to read what you highlighted in your comments or the paragraph. You know, and if I read three or four paragraphs, I've got most of what's valuable in that document. I don't necessarily have to read it all, right? So it's a way of dealing with information overload. And in one experiment we did with just two students, these were high school students. They read 15 documents each, combined them, and were able to come up with just really outstanding ideas and summary of what they had read in a way that you would never expect high school students to do. So there's this idea of scaffolding this uh, learning process through what you were describing, a distributed sense-making activity supported by a frame builder. Right, and, and a collaborative and Yeah, that definitely has a lot of common themes with some stuff that I'm working on. Uh, so yeah, I, I mentioned maybe you had just joined the call about the fourth edition of this book I'm working on. And to be honest, the third edition is okay, but the fourth edition I hope will be so much better because it will hopefully have many more small pieces which are integrated with each other. So, so this gets back to this like future of text theme and how to do it, how to organize it and stuff like that. And that's still this big, um, I don't know what the right word is, uh, uh, hodgepodge, I guess, um, crucible, I don't know, something between a hodgepodge and a crucible of <laughs> ideas which are, which are uh, still forming somewhere. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, stay tuned about that, uh, if, if, if there's a way to, to share. I guess, will you, will you guys uh, come along to a future of these things? I, I hope that we'll be able to stay in touch given common themes of interest. So maybe I'll see them on I would hope so. Friday, yep. that'd be good, that'd be good. Um, I'm, uh, so were, were you going to keep this to a full, to an hour exactly? Or? Yeah, yeah, roughly. I just wanted to mention uh, two small things. One is to send a screenshot because on the, that page there, I know it's nothing to do with what you're talking about, but the little anchors to the side of the headings. Yeah. I invented that for Doug many years ago. Huh. I'm sure these people independently invented it. I'm not claiming any greatness here, but and uh, the reason was Doug Engelbart, of course, had these purple numbers for paragraph level addressability. Yeah. So on this page, all they're doing is um, having a, an anchor link to itself. So if you copied link to lo link, 
you copy link to that location. So that was just kind of nice to see. Um, and then on a very, taking what you guys were talking about, taking a very low, and again, a little bit of visual meta, there's an approach, I just put a link into the chat of uh, glossaries. And the reason for that is, uh, Joe, you mentioned, you know, ha having these, what you're working on the material, having it more, I would say, hypertextual, to paraphrase you, and then pulling it together. So for so many years in different communities, we've been talking about glossaries. Glossaries can be amazing things. And then, as I'm sure you've gone through exactly the same thinking we have, where do you put the definitions? Is it in the document or is it somewhere else? How do you make sure they're updated or should they not be updated? All these issues. So in this um, uh, link, if you just have a quick look at the screenshot so we don't waste time reading it. Um, imagine an author or any other word processor, you write the word dynamic view, for instance, and you realize, I don't want to define this every time. So you select it, you do command G, gives you a dialogue where, command, where dynamic view is the term and below that you can write a definition. The reason it's editable in the term is because it could have maybe an acronym or something else. All that then happens is that the system, when you click save, if you haven't already got a normal glossary heading at the end of the document, it creates that and adds this where the, the term is in bold, the rest of it is not bold, that's it. So it's plain text, anybody can read the glossary as part of a normal PDF. The only difference, and if you please look at the last screenshots, which is a bit tiny, is that in all the software that I use, and I'm sure similar things, you select text, you do Command F, and it does a search. In Reader and Author, what it does is show you all the lines with that text in a folded view, so you can instantly go out. You don't have to scroll through the document. So the bottom half of it is that, not super fancy at all, but the usability thing is that if this term is also bold and glossaries, it's listed on top. Hmm. So the yeah. user doesn't even need to know if it's a glossary term or not. It's just another way to find out. And then finally to say, you make a new document, copy the glossary section into the new document, you got it. Edit it if you want, edit it not. It's just a way to try to keep things extremely simple, having spent so many years trying to make it extremely not simple. So, so, so this is great. I would say at the risk of complexifying something that I, I genuinely think is great, partly because it's simple, another level on top of it that could be kind of fun would be to surface other glossary terms besides the one you're looking for. Supposing that with I search for dynamic view and you happen to have, say, mentioned future of text, for example, in one of these other paragraphs, and that itself has a glossary term, your glossary section could expand, you know, like those cards or something and say, okay, well, here's dynamic views what you're searching for, but actually you've got a kind of time machine like level of depth that now we're pulling all these other cards, which happen to be surfaced by the same, um, what is it called? Well, well this is also where the poetry for, comes into it because this little dialogue can have whatever fields you want. So you could define relationships or whatever. That's entirely, you know, in Doug's uh, NLS and Augment, there were various user levels. You could unlock different levels. You could have custom things. So when you do the command F and it shows you that, it can show you with a huge amount of relationships that are, and this is so important, in the glossary, it's just plain text. But the whole idea of the visual meta at the end says, this thing is this in this way. So that's why we, when we did the dates thing earlier, it can't just say 7 slash 23 slash 2020. This is that European or American standard. It has to say what it is, right? So for instance, it could say, this is a part of the moon in Japanese poetry for this. So it's human and machine readable. So that's why I'm thinking some of the advanced components you're talking about, Joe, could be shoehorned into this. The poetry could be shoehorned into it. I'm hopefully hoping to have it finished in a week or two so we can play with it. Anyway. What about uh, offering like synonyms, homonyms, and so forth to trigger? Yeah. We, yeah, well, that's a very good question. First of all, if you just select text within the universe we have and use liquid, you can look up anything instantly. But if it's within this little dialogue where you type the term, you can do comma, acronym, comma, different way of spelling, like Ted Nelson, is it Theodore Hall Nelson, is it Ted, anything you want. Mm -hmm. 
because the thing about humans is we're very messy creatures. I have a close friend who is quite autistic. You wouldn't be able to tell for the first 10 days you know him because he's so eloquent and colorful with language, which was a bit of a shock. He is the least computable person I know, even though he's in computer science. This is always a flowery sentence. So to deal with the flowery sentences, not so simple and, you know, simple thing. But anyway. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, gentlemen, I'm going to have to uh, leave the discussion at this point. I have another meeting I have to head to. But thank you so much for uh, letting me be involved. And uh, I, I uh, look forward to catching up some more soon. Very nice. Nice Thanks to so meet much. you, Derek. Meet you. Please feel free to come in and out of these in the middle, at the end, what, how often it's very, it's literally an open door, nothing fancy. Good to see Sounds you. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Yeah, and we just, uh, so Dave wanted to visit next Friday. That's, that's, uh, is there a specific agenda for the Friday meetings or? No, th this is the first meeting ever in the series. And um, I do have a little bit more of a bent on the Monday meetings being more visual meta because I have to create a community around that. And if anyone has questions, however, if there isn't a special interest on Mondays, we talk about whatever. And, you know, it's my current passion. So I'm probably going to, like I did today, mention it in, on another Friday. But I'm very, very happy right. to have different viewpoints and perspectives like you guys have had today. Great. And right. also, yeah. feel free. Um, I'm not sure how to do this yet because it is literally just an open door. This is not a seminar or anything. Uh, how can we, let's say the three or four of us, share stuff in between these sessions? Because it seems like there are some things worth sharing. Should we do a hashtag on Twitter or what should we do? Hmm. I have no idea. Uh, I mean, or, or should we blog or should we try to build some sort of a mailing list? It's just I'm really, really concerned about not bothering people. Some of the people in the book are a bit prickly about being contacted. Uh, and some <laughs> are kind of yeah. the opposite. So it's hard to know other than people have shown up. Mm -hmm. hmm. You both use Twitter? I, I'm taking a little hiatus from Twitter right now. I, do, do, I'm, I am on Twitter, but... Uh... I think uh, I like the I like the workflow of sharing things in this little chat. What about something that was like a chat that's not Twitter, but that's like a slightly Black private or Discord or something like that? Yeah, something like that. Do you both blog? I am just starting. That's one of these post startup things. We have another uh, blog where we're kind of putting yeah. some of our um, kind of relatively polished pieces on that blog so that's going to be getting going i'd be happy to feed that in someplace else i think it would relate to this but you see then the thing is it's it's not really focused on this discussion or this community uh but i would be happy to share it that's the nature of a blog let's just keep it in the room where it happens for now yeah something like that hang on does that mean both of you have not seen hamilton no i haven't seen it i haven't but i guess i recognize your reference yeah slightly no, I know all about it. It's because it's been in the media so much, but I have not seen it yet. Oh, you're so lucky. You have the first time coming. Yeah, it's really that good. It, yeah, yeah. It, it is life changing, which is really? astounding because it is the stage is nothing, it's just a backdrop. Yeah. Uh, the music is, is nice, a little bit of hip hop, very much of it is just normal musical. There's a little bit of a love story kind of thing, um, but. The, the most powerful line in the whole thing is, and that's when the experiment of America happened. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys are American people. Mm -hmm. You know, we're sitting over here looking at America as a beacon of all kinds of things, and currently it's a house on fire. Not that Britain is doing anything better. So to be watching it at a time of Trump is um, quite a moving experience. Yeah, no, I, so I, I, I mean, the Greeks had a lot to say, ancient Greeks, about people who get into positions of power that they would have been fine if they just stayed in their shoe shop or whatever it was, but they get to be king, like Creon in Antigone, right? And they can cause tremendous havoc. So here, for a variety of reasons, people in this country have elected somebody with a very serious personality disorder, 
I mean, there's just no other way to describe what, what this guy is, is, is about. And what uh, I'll just, just real quickly, my view of this is what, what we're seeing, I, I don't know if you know Sheldon Poland's book, Democracy Inc., but it's sort of the classic political philosophy book. Basically, this country has become what he calls inverted totalitarianism that through the gift, that is the money that the corporations and oligarchs have given to people in office and the promises of payoffs and when they get out of office, we essentially have a government that is owned by oligarchs and corporations that are driven by a sociopathic uh, obsession with profit. And then you combine that with a whole bunch of ways the mind works to favor in-group uh, uh, affiliations and so forth and so on. Uh, you know, we're on our way to global ecocide. You know, and it's just uh, so that's you know, in some ways, highlighter is an effort to try and maybe have more evidence-based kind of decision making. And and so. And, and I, here's the, just the last thing I'll say is Donald Trump, like Steve Jobs, what's the, what's the connection there? Steve Jobs was described as being able to create a reality distortion field that sucked in the people around him to some extent to be able to go beyond what they thought was possible. And I think Donald Trump has, yes, done the same thing, created this reality distortion field that is sucked in a lot, you know, 40% of it. It's, it's I just really something to watch. I just sent you a screenshot of the uh, of Larry from Hamilton. Okay. I think you will both cry when you hear this bit, when you hear it in the show. It's huh. when Washington yeah. steps aside. And you know how monumental, just like you said, how monumental it was when he did that. It's, it's wonderful. Anyway, I'm afraid I also have to uh, toodle. Um, I have to pick up my three-year-old son, which is, of course, a very important. Well, it's the best part of the day, anyway. Um, thank you very, good very you. much. And hope to see you on Mondays or Fridays um, anytime. And of course, feel free to text or email or anything. Uh, yeah, thank you again. Cool. Yeah, great. Thanks for having us. See you later. Yeah, great to meet you guys in person. Yeah, have a good weekend. Yes. Too, as well. Bye. Yeah. Bye.